I'm Doug Wood, the chair of the Department of Surgery. Welcome to, to Surgical Grand Rounds. And we've got a special morning this morning. And I know that there are many more people trying to get here because I just got a text that the line to get into S1 is 15 minutes long and that there's still people waiting to get into S1. So it's a very special morning for us because we have our own Dr. Pellegrini that's giving Grand Rounds. Uh, and I'm going to take advantage of, of him being our special guest to give a little bit more of an introduction than we would normally do, particularly because we have so many guests here, people beyond the Department of Surgery from many other departments. Dr. Pellegrini grew up in Argentina uh, with parents who are doctors. And if you look at this first slide, you can see that although he had a very happy childhood, I guess some days he didn't look as happy as represented by the rest of his childhood. Uh, but he, he grew up in uh, near Rosario, Argentina. Uh, uh, and one little known fact that most people don't know, but was an important area of connection between Dr. Pellegrini and myself, was when he was a senior in high school, he was a foreign exchange student and actually went to uh, high school and graduated from high school in Kalamazoo, Michigan. He graduated from Portage High School in Kalamazoo, Michigan. You can see him as a student in high school, and he, he was a good student, but I also want to emphasize he was somewhat of a nerd, uh, as you can see from the well-established pocket protector uh, so popular in the 1960s. Uh, so Carlos graduated from high school uh, in Portage High School, Kalamazoo, Michigan, returned to Argentina, went to medical school, and then uh, completed a general surgery residency uh, in Rosario, Argentina. He then had an opportunity to, to do a research fellowship at the University of Chicago, and he was so well received there that they actually offered him another general surgery residency. So uh, Carlos had the benefit of a second general surgery residency in the United States after completing one in Argentina. And it was there at the University of Chicago where he was mentored both by Tom DeMeester and David Skinner, who were important influences in his life, and important aspects of him becoming a prominent esophageal surgeon. Carlos was then recruited to UCSF as an assistant professor, and actually has many connections here at the University of Washington from his time at UCSF. As an assistant professor at UCSF, he rose rapidly through the ranks in both in terms of academic promotion and leadership to the point that he was recruited to be the chair of the Department of Surgery here at the University of Washington in 1993. So Carlos was the chair of the Department of Surgery for 23 years, by far the longest Department of Surgery chair ever at the University of Washington even exceeding the first chair of surgery, Henry Harkins himself, who was chair for 17 years. I put up here, and I think this speaks volume, of the person that Dr. Pellegrini is. These are the things that he is most proud of, and I want to talk a little bit about what Carlos has done within the Department of Surgery and within UW Medicine, and why he is giving this lecture this morning. In the Department of Surgery, under Carlos's leadership, the size of the faculty and the number of clinical programs has more than doubled. We now have 177 faculty in the Department of Surgery, and a fr only a fraction of this when Dr. Pellegrini came here, and a breadth of clinical programs that are outstanding. We have division chiefs and faculty that are leaders locally and nationally. At the same time, Carlos has developed 19 endowed chairs and professorships during his tenure as chair, and many of us are the recipients and beneficiaries and support the research programs in the Department of Surgery. Carlos has been focused on the development of research, an example being the development of the Surgical Outcomes Research Center with Dave Flum, an example of his leadership on the side of research. He has also been focused on education. We now have four residency programs and 11 fellowship programs in the Department of Surgery. And every single one of them is at the top of their peer group in the United States. 
That has to do with the leadership of our program directors and the leadership of Dr. Pellegrini. Of course, Carlos has made numerous scientific contributions. His curriculum vitae is a wealth of accomplishments and publications. But I think what people most respect and know him for is his leadership. The fact is, he has been leader of most of the important surgical associations in the United States. The American Surgical Association, the Society for Surgery of the Alimentary Tract, the Society of Surgical Chairs, and probably the pinnacle of leadership in American surgery, the president of the American College of Surgeons. He has honorary fellowships from all over the world. In fact, it's, it's kind of embarrassing how many honorary fellowships and professorships he's had. And he's a recipient of the French Medal of Honor from the French government for his contributions to surgery. Two years ago, Carlos was named as the first chief medical officer at UW Medicine. So we are now privileged to have his leadership at the highest level in UW Medicine after his long and successful tenure as chair of the Department of Surgery. While all of these accomplishments are terrific, I think what most of us respect and appreciate Carlos for is his mentorship. And most of us have been the recipients of that mentorship and support and his leadership and integrity. He has an incredibly deep well of close friends. In fact, I don't think there is anyone that he doesn't know. Whenever I talk with him about somebody that I've just met, Carlos says, oh yes, I know them, they're a very close friend. I mean, it, it's almost ubiquitous. Carlos knows everyone I have ever met and he is close to them. He shared a meal with them, they've stayed at his house, and it's so extreme, his generosity and the breadth of his connections is remarkable. And as you'd expect, it even extends to the Pope. So this is no joke. Pope Francis and Carlos are both from Argentina, and one time I'm challenging him about whether he knows the Pope, and of course he does. And I don't remember the reason, uh, whether they played on the same soccer team or whether they went to school together, but Carlos knows Pope Francis. Most of us have been the beneficiaries of the great stories that Carlos tells. He is an amazing storyteller, and we've been the beneficiaries of stories of intrigue, excitement, embarrassment, accomplishment, and some of them are even true. Carlos, I think, is one of the best examples that we can hold up as a person of honor, integrity, and an incredible deep moral compass and emotional intelligence. And it's why we love you and what we respect as your colleagues and as your friends. And those of us here today are glad that we are your close friends, because those of us in this room are. Dr. Pellegrini has had a long interest in ethics, and in the ethics of surgery. And last year he was honored to be asked to give the John J. Conley Lecture in Ethics and Philosophy at the American College of Surgeons. And so we are very lucky to have Dr. Pellegrini give us this lecture again this morning that he gave to the American College of Surgeons last year. Trust, the keystone of the physician-patient relationship. Dr. Pellegrini. Well, Doug, you outdid yourself, uh, as usual. I am uh, uh, honored that uh, you introduced me today. I was thinking Dave was going to do, introduce me, and I would have loved to have Dave introduce me. And I had thought about what to say about Dave, but not about you. <laughs> I, I, I can say one thing about you, and that is, uh, as a new chair of surgery, obviously, I'm delighted that you uh, have taken the Department of Surgery reins. Uh, you have an influence in this school. I have never seen so many people come to surgical grand rounds. <laughs> and and uh, I, I realized on Monday night when I was uh, at Richard Allen Bogan's uh, department and he was making just announcements. He's announced on Wednesday, uh, October 4th, 6.30 in the morning, everybody has to be in T625. And I just thought, 
T625, that's what I'm speaking. <laughs> and uh, I see Richard sitting there as well as so many of you. So thank you uh, and good morning. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm certainly very appreciative that you came. And I'm confident that what I have to say uh, applies to most human beings. So if you're a surgeon, uh, this touches you probably a little bit closer. But if you are not a surgeon, um, you know, we in surgery talk about surgeons and the rest of the population, which we call non-surgeons. <laughs> so if, if, if you're not a surgeon, uh, I hope that you will find uh, uh, this uh, of use as well. I have no conflict of interest to disclose, but I do want to disclose to you, and I think Doug uh, uh, alluded to it, that what I am about to tell you is not uh, the usual talk about techniques or outcomes in surgery, uh, but it is about ethics, uh, it is about philosophy, and it's about relationships with fellow human beings. And I say so because if you think of surgery, and if you think of surgery grand rounds, you, you, you sort of think, uh, I think, this way, right? You, you view in your mind uh, a picture of an individual with a few others helping working with his hands in this case, uh, trying to solve the problem, trying to change the anatomy, trying to resect, remove this, you know, change what's going on there, and, and take care of an ailment. And because of that, most people, when you think of surgery, the reality is that the focus is on the technical ability and the dexterity that the individual has. And most of the training that we tend to receive has to do with technique and dexterity. A lot of less has been emphasized in ethics and philosophy uh, in general. And today my, my task is to convince you, as I talk a little bit about some thoughts on, on, on ethics and, and philosophy as I see them, to convince you that uh, Focusing on the generation of trust through adequate communications is an essential element of the surgeon's life. I have come to believe that it goes far beyond the relationship that we establish with the patient because it is the relationship that we establish with everybody around us that makes surgery and the surgical results uh, what, what they are. To that end, let me tell you a little bit about my own journey. Uh, Doug told you my life journey, I'll tell you my own journey into this particular field. Uh, I joined surgery because I had that picture in mind just as well. And I was at the time uh, fascinated, interested uh, in the GI tract. And I thought that surgery was a vehicle for me to make changes to the GI tract with my own hands that would hopefully improve the quality of life of other human beings. And that Occasionally, I would cure somebody from a dreadful disease, as it is the case with esophageal cancer. Uh, most often, I would prolong life or palliate somebody. Uh, very often, we would be changing the function of the GI tract and improving the quality of life of uh, somebody else. I did not embrace the study of philosophy or ethics or read anything about it in, in the early stages of my development. Um, but as Life went by, I came to realize that the, the power to heal that I had, if any, uh, the, the ability to have good outcomes with patients was directly related to the type of relationship I established with the patient. That the more I, I delved into the patient's life, the more I, I established that relationship between the surgeon and the patient that was based on something that I couldn't describe then, but I then realized later on it would be trust. As soon as we establish that bond, the chances of having a better outcome as seen by the eyes of the patient increase significantly. And as I did so, and I started reading and studying a little bit about what are the mechanisms that get two human beings closer together, I realized that that allowed me to understand myself a lot more, to know what things tick me off, to know how to control myself when 
I was facing one of those events, and slowly to understand myself. And as a consequence of this, not because I programmed it, but it came to the realization that we work in a health system. We work every day with other surgeons, with physicians of other kinds, and that if I establish the same relationship, which is a relationship based on respect, or mutual understanding, of caring for another human being, with the members of the team, and when I'm talking members of the team, I'm talking about members of the operating team, but I'm also talking about the nurses on the ward, I'm talking about the residents that are on your team, I'm talking about uh, the, the Department of Surgery faculty, the administration. If, if you had that essential elements that I will describe for you in a moment that are the basis for the generation of trust, then life was better. And to me, the, the greatest discovery of this, and, and maybe I, one day I can come and, and talk about that, is the tremendous effect that this has in preventing work, uh, in preventing burnout. Because I, I realized that as you become happier with what you do, as you're welcome with a smile by people that are working with you that day. As you find the friends that Doug was talking about, people that you establish a relationship, that maybe it's just a story, a little something that happened between two human beings that is a little bit different than just the professional aspect, that that, to me personally, is, is the biggest deterrent to feeling burned out. I wake up in the morning, sometimes early, sometimes very early, and believe it or not, at my age of 71, I say, how many hours before I go to the office? It, it is that kind of thing that makes you um, not feel overwhelmed or overburned. So the title of this talk was supposed to be Trust, the Keystone of the relationship, patient, uh, patient Relationship, and I will keep it to that, but I just wanted to give you that brief introduction in terms of the importance that I think that <coughs> the, the generation of those uh, relationships are. To the effect of this talk, I want you to think for a moment of trust as a, as a, as a little red stone there. And imagine that little red stone for just a second. And let me go back to the human relationships that I talked to you about before. And I think or imagine a human relationship as, a, as an arch as depicted on this picture. And I think of the physician on the one side, and on the other side of the arch, I think of the patient, I think of the physician herself or himself, I think of the system that the individual relates to. And so that's a human relationship. And that little red stone that I told you there is the trust. Now that stone, if you, if you think for a moment, you remove that stone, the, the whole thing crumbles, the, the, the arch disintegrates. It is that stone, the so-called keystone, a concept that was actually developed by the Etruscans 2,500 years ago, that keeps that integrity of that particular arch. And that concept was not only developed by them a long time ago, but then taken up by the Romans who started perfecting that keystone, and started perfecting it to the extent that they started using it on gates, they started using it on aqueducts, they started using it on bridges, as something that would have, as the most important element of the arch itself, would have the ability to keep that uh, in, in its uh, full integrity. So I view trust then to a relationship like the keystone is to an arch. I think that it is essential to keep the integrity of the arch, okay? And it is with that concept that I would like to uh, describe trust in a little bit more detail in just a minute. But before I do that, if we have agreed that this is a pictorial representation of a human relationship with somebody else or with the person himself, and if we have agreed on the importance of trust, as represented by the keystone, I have learned that communication is what sits in that arch, in the middle of that arch, between the person and himself or the person 
and the patient or the person and somebody else. It is through communications that we establish that relationship. And I'm not talking about a verbal communication here. I'm, not, I'm talking communication in the broadest extent. Communication is a smile. Communication is looking at somebody eye to eye, like I'm looking at Roger right now. Communication is recognizing somebody. Communication is getting upset. Communication is making a, you know, a face. Uh, communication is not paying attention to somebody who's telling you something because you grab your telephone and you start answering uh, a message, right? So you, in every, every one of those behaviors that you model, you're communicating something. And you're communicating something that sometimes you don't think you are communicating. But you are communicating something no matter what you do. And, and that has become something that I think if we look at it from a practical perspective, not an academic perspective, is an important aspect to, to preserve that. So let me then uh, start, uh, give you a few uh, thoughts about trust itself as it relates to medicine. And then uh, three or four slides on what I think communication uh, is and how communication directly relates to trust. So for trust itself, a definition that I like is this one from the dictionary that says, that says essentially is the assured reliance on the character, the ability, the strength, or the truth of someone or something. Where I believe the key word is reliance. And reliance from one person onto another person character, onto another person's strength. And it, it's not only about the persons. So, you know, the, the, the animal kingdom shows us trust all the time. Think of a flock of birds and think of the leader of the flock of birds. It's only trust on the strength and reliance on the strength of the leader of that flock that makes all the other uh, birds fly in the same direction, right? And that reliance is very important because that reliance brings about vulnerability. And so Edmund Pellegrini, a Pellegrino actually, a very uh, famous philosopher that wrote a lot about trust, talks about the fact that to trust and to entrust is to become vulnerable. Is the vulnerability because you are relying on, on somebody's character, right? And dependent on the goodwill and the motivation of those who we trust. And Bernard Barber, the sociologist that writes a lot about trust, defines trust with three sort of conditions. Persistent moral order. Remember that reliance on somebody else is based on the moral order. Perform technical role properly when relating to any profession. So it's a commitment that you have and altruism or will do so with a concern for others. So there is, a, there is these three conditions that lead us to think that in medicine, you can translate those conditions from a practical perspective in the possession of knowledge necessary to do something to another person, the autonomy given to you by the person necessary for you to practice and exercise your skill and your set of values, hopefully with the understanding of the values of the other person in the treatment, and the fiduciary obligation of individuals uh, to individuals or, or to society. It, it is always the moral character, it is always the permission, and it is always the vulnerability and the altruism that go together. It's the beliefs on the benevolence and, and, and morals of the, of the physician. In medicine, I, I view trust as having five or six different twists that are not seen in most other professions. The first one is the affective nature, the dependence that a person who is sick has on the physician. So it, it, it is unlike most other professions where perhaps a relationship with a lawyer, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful to a lawyer, but a relationship to a, an accountant, a relationship to a technical person, uh, that relationship is subject to less affection than it is to a physician. You see embraces and you see hugs and you see the kinds of things that most patients are, are, are associate with trusting their uh, provider. In medicine, it's important that we keep skills and values very clearly up front because we have made a promise. We have a 
contract, if you wish, with society. We, we are relied upon, as the original sentence that I showed you said, to provide skillful work, and, and that means continuous learning throughout our lives. There's a lot of papers that have shown that trust is directly associated with adherence to treatment. And, and this gives a base to my original premise when I started telling you that I, I thought that my power to heal somebody was directly related to the trust generated on that person. And we know now from a lot of studies that patients who trust their doctor, as you would logically think, tend to adhere to treatment. And so you can see that this has a direct therapeutic effect on, on the patient. Interestingly enough, patient satisfaction is directly related to trust. So if you look at papers that, that relate the issue of trust to patient satisfaction, you see that, again, physicians, uh, patients that have trust on physicians, particularly when they have developed what I'll describe in a moment as mutual trust. That is, they, the patients, perceived the physician trusting them. And satisfaction indices are much greater. And so it, it is not surprising to me that, that we pay a lot more attention to the issue of trust and how to gain the trust of another human being and how to deliver on the promise just for a business perspective to get better patient scores. And of course, in medicine, uh, we go back to that vulnerability that Edmund Pellegrino had described when you rely on somebody else. Vulnerability is, is, is something that happens in every state of dependence as the theory goes, right? Any state of dependence, a spiritual state of dependence, a learning state of dependence, and, and you now can tie learning environment and the power that the teacher has over the student or the resident or whoever it is, because that person is relying on the teacher and that person is showing a vulnerability. But vulnerability is particularly uh, so when the dependence originates from injury, originates from disease, originates from something that the person who gets it has very little control on. And not only has very little control, but has very little means of becoming non-dependent unless and until that person seeks the care of somebody else who has the power of healing, who has the ability to heal, who has the skills to heal, etc. So that poses, a, I think, an important philosophical uh, um, duty on us. Is that fiduciary duty that coming back to the altruistic portion of trust that we have to respect. We have to be advocates and we have to make sure that we are not in any way exploiting the vulnerability of a patient. Because a patient is much more likely to take my advice. If I say, I think you need an operation. If you, anyone here, I'm sure that some of you have been patients. When the doctor says you need an operation, the patient is much more likely to say yes because of an inherent trust on the physician. And it is, a, it is then our obligation to make certain that we have disclosed the rationale, that we have disclosed the risks, that we have looked at the values from the perspective of the patient to the extent that we can, that we recognize that we don't have, we're not inside that patient, so we'll never know what the real values are, right, for that individual. But it is incumbent upon us to make sure that we remember the tremendous vulnerability that the state of dependence caused by an injury uh, has on a patient. And that is particularly relevant at a time of incentives because we work in a system, uh, some of you have heard me talk about incentives before, but we work in a system where every service that we provide is remunerated in some form or fashion and you receive, I receive, and every one of us does, a certain amount of payment uh, for the services that we provide. So we, we are in a system that, by the nature of fee-for-service, the system is potentially facilitating the exploitation of the vulnerability of a patient. Now, I don't want to get too deep. This is not a political talk about how the system should be, but perhaps I give you my, my own thought on, on my stance. But the system of fee-for-service is one that 
uh, has to be used very carefully by us, the entrusted parties, if we want to deliver on the fiduciary duty that I was talking about before, because the system is asking us to do more. And for those of you who think that I'm talking against the value-based system, value-based does not solve this problem at all. Because on the value-based system, we have the opposite, right? On the value-based system, we're asked to do less. The system is asking us to do less. On the fee-for-services system, it's asking us to do more. And in either case, we can err in delivering the entrustment that the patient had to us, right? So I believe that it is very important for us to learn a little bit about how to generate that trust, to learn a little bit about the philosophical aspects of how do you deliver the moral contract that we have as physicians, and how do we guard, whether we are in the fee-for-service system or on the value-based system, how do we guard the rights of those patients and how do we protect the vulnerability that I was talking about. And because of these underlying currents that systems have developed, there's a whole chapter in ethics that is the ethics of distrust. And the ethics of distrust, in one word, is to say, we cannot trust that. How do we get around that? We get around that with a contract. And what we do is we convert, we transfer the trust from the person-to-person -person relationship to a formal obligation in the form of a contract. And that could be a living will, a power of attorney, an advanced directive. That could be the consent that we sign every day for surgery, as you, as you think about it when the signatures come into place and when you do a lot of promises that this is going to happen or I will give you permission to draw my blood, to hit my head, to put my picture up on the web, whatever it is that patients give permission to, those are contractual relationships that to a certain extent uh, are the result of someone, somebody, systems having lost their trust on the person-to-person Issue. And if you go to uh, practice in uh, underdeveloped areas of the world, you will see that for some reason, trust has been preserved in those areas to a much greater extent, and contractual obligations are not as commonly said. Those contractual obligations sometimes have problems because people tend to write down what they think they would like to do in a certain position at a certain time when that has never been faced by the individual. And sometimes that eventually conflicts with the values of, of the persons. So I, I told you a little bit about the mistrust that has occurred in our culture as we become more pervasive, the rising suspicion that patients harbor toward physicians, occasionally the degradation of social trust in our political systems, and the general erosion of trust between employees and employers. And that leads to, to something that uh, society has created to, to replace, I think in a very imperfect fashion, trust. And you have to be careful what you write in an advanced directive, you know, interpretation of wishes, as this cartoon says. The husband is telling the wife, just so that you know, I never want to live in a vegetative state of dependence on some machine. If that ever happens, just unplug me, okay? How would that is interpreted by the other person is, is sometimes <laughs> important to remember. So, two more aspects of trust before I turn into communications briefly, and, and that is the, the physician's trust in the patient is also extraordinarily important. We know that when the patients believe that there's mutual trust, the potential consequences for both parties uh, Studies have shown that, and these are mostly soft studies based on philosophical analysis, that physicians derive a substantial amount of pleasure when they feel trusted by patients. And, not difficult to understand, patients derive a substantial amount of pleasure in their relationship when they feel the physician trusts them. So, to the extent that you can, with your patients, and trust them, just like in other states of dependence, like learning, we tend to empower our residents, show them that we're confident of what they can do by allowing them to do something that goes a little bit further and perhaps beyond what 
they think they are capable of. And it's that little stretching, carefully done over time, whether it's in a procedure or in a conversation with a patient or a decision making or something that empowers another human being that shows the other person you have trust on the person. And, and that is an important element that, you know, uh, patients come in with trust on the institution, they establish trust to patients, they establish uh, trust to physician, trust to patient, and, and that eventually leads to more adherence to treatment, more satisfaction, and better outcomes altogether. And the last element of, of trust in this medicine part is the social aspect of trust. Social trust is a little bit of a different animal, but it is essentially based on people's experiences in life. So every one of us, just think of you at any time, you walk into an environment, and in this case, let's make it that the environment is the hospital or the clinic or the place where you're gonna see a physician. You walk into that area with a certain amount of trust in the system, in the institution, right? And, and that is what I was talking about vulnerability, how important it is that when somebody is sick, somebody doesn't have any other place to go than the hospital. But every one of us has a different degree of trust on the system itself. Uh, think communities of color, how they would feel when you think of the Tuskegee experiment or many other genetic experiments that have been done on Native Americans and others. How do those communities feel with regards to the trust of the system and the people that populate the system? That is us, physicians, healthcare providers of all sorts. The, the interesting aspect of social trust is that it is much easier to manipulate, much easier to change, much more dynamic than the person-to-person -person trust. And to me, that was a very important discovery as I was reading, because we, physicians and healthcare providers in general, can really improve the social trust by things that we do in a visit, or we can decrease the social trust. And it's shown, for example, that a patient that comes in sort of like, what is this going to be like? I'm going to see a doctor. The doctor makes a lot of money. The doctor has abused my community. You know, those kinds of things. And finds a person that greets them with a smile, finds a person that uh, maybe is a little bit late and apologizes for being late, uh, takes responsibility for being late. How that starts working on the social trust of that patient that is looking at that individual. And think for a minute of the opposite. Think that you walk in and you say, I didn't know you were here. I don't know, I work in this place and they gave you an appointment at the wrong time. They have me overbooked, you know, it's always the same. In this hospital, they overbook me all the time. So what's your problem? And, and think of the two differences on how the person there would perceive the trust on the institution or the improvement or the, or the disapproval of trust. So trust in general, uh, as I told you before, is, is to the relationships uh, like the keystone is to, is to the arch. It, it is essential for the integrity. Without it, you cannot have a good relationship with a patient. And you can translate this to the other healthcare workers that work around you. With it, I think you not only improve the patients, but you also improve yourself. So communication, how does communication come into, into play in my mind with regards to the trust? Uh, communication is the act or process of using words, sounds, signs, or behaviors, okay? To express or exchange information or to express ideas, thoughts, feelings. So communication is a very broad perspective, first of all. Remember when I talked to you about the smile, when I talked to you about the things that we do to pay attention to somebody else who's talking to us, etc., is the behavior that becomes part of communication. Wikipedia defines communication as the act of conveying intended meanings from one entity to another through the use of mutual and understood signs. I don't think it's always intended meaning. Sometimes you communicate a lot that is unintended. You didn't mean to offend somebody. When you said something, when you uh, make a smirk on this face, when you did something different, you did not mean it. So it's not always intentions. So 
it's, I'm not giving you all of that just because I, I, I want to make it more complicated, but because I wanted to bring you to this graph that to me is, is it was very revealing the first time I, I, I saw it. Communication starts with intent, and I would say to you many times, starts without intent. So I differ a little bit of this, of this sort of uh, mechanism that, I, that I'm, I'm putting in here for you. But let's assume that there's an intent in your brain to communicate somebody to something. So you, your brain very rapidly composes a message. Is the message going to be a smile? Is the message going to be being upset? Is, is it a word? Is it a scream? Very rapidly then, the brain encodes that message and then the brain transmits that message usually through movements, through expressions, through behaviors. And this is all more or less part of your control. But then the other party receives the message, right? And remember what we talked about, social trust and so forth. They decode that message, but then they have to interpret the message. So you, you can see that in any aspect of communication from here, all the way, the way you compose it and code it, the way you transmit it, the way the other person receives it, the code is uninterpreted. It is possible that at the end of the day, you actually relay the intended message or that you didn't. And that the message perceived by others was not what you actually intended to do. So from this, my, well, first of all, it's obvious that communication is much more than words, right? Uh, let me show you this slide, and then I'll tell you what I was about to tell you a minute ago. Um, this is somebody that studied what people hear or interpret from actions from other individuals. And look at how little verbal, how much more tone, and how much nonverbal communication exists. And, and this is not scientific. This is not proven by any... You know, this is philosophy and ethics are interpretations of observations of human life. They are not statistically significant. But it just gives you an idea that what we say is, is tiny little. It's what we do. It's the way we walk the walk of life that, that really uh, means. So my personal tips, knowing that from the intent to the interpretation, there would be a lot of potential changes whether I'm talking to a patient, to a colleague, or to somebody else, is first of all, I love this sentence, do not attribute ill intent to anything that you hear. So my first posture when I don't understand a message, when a message, as I have decoded it in my mind, and as I have interpreted the message, is not in parallel with my values or with the values of the other person is to not attribute ill intent. It's very easy to get upset otherwise. It's very easy to just attribute ill intent to. I, I believe most human beings are decent. Most human beings have values similar to mine, and, and therefore, I give them the benefit of the doubt. If I cannot reconcile it after some thought, and sometimes I can't, and, and you will find that in your life many times as well, then if I cannot reconcile what, what I heard with what you know, my values are, feelings, viewpoints, etc. then I seek a chance to rediscuss it. I give it another thought, another chance. And I tell the other person, you know, when you're talking with me, try not to get the goddamn phone and start answering messages. It displeases me. You're not paying attention to me. You're doing something else. You're diverting your attention. I know that you don't mean it, right? But this is... So I try, to, I try to go on that route, give the person a second chance. And if it still doesn't work, and of course, you know, in order to get here, I wouldn't say that I, every single time that I don't like something, I go for a second go. Sometimes I say, I don't think I'm going to go anywhere with the second discussion, so I just quit. But in general, I think it's a good idea to say there are these three steps that are possible if you want to preserve a working relationship, right? The third one is the most difficult one by far and away, for me anyway. If it still doesn't work, maybe it's time to let go. And it's the most difficult one because if you decide that you're going to let go, 
then you have to let go. You have to do that. You have to let go, meaning you're never going to think about it again or talk to that person about it again. Just let it go, okay? It's not worth it. If this one did not provide the explanation, then you can let go. And sometimes you're not going to be able to let go, and you're going to hold the grudge. And that relationship will, by necessity, crumble because that communication <laughs> led to a falling of that keystone and, and the trust that you had on that person is gone. And, and that's okay too. You know, I mean, not everybody's perfect and sometimes human relationships go that way. Uh, a very important aspect of communications is the patient-centered communication and Epstein, who has written the most about that, defines it as one that elicits, understands and validates the perspective of the patient. This is very difficult to do, as you know understands the patient's psychological and social context. Uh, the more you read about this, the more you realize how difficult it is for any one of us walking into a clinic today and meeting another human being who's facing a tremendous problem, really, really put ourselves in the shoes of that patient. We should try, but, but it's extremely difficult. If you do those two, you reach a certain understanding, and then eventually you empower the patient with that relationship. The environment has a lot to do with the communication. And I, and I like this picture, which is actually a picture of ours here, and it's in our own website. Because I see the right sternocleidomastoid muscle of this person really tight. She doesn't have a neurologic disease. She's just trying to use it to raise her head. Uh, as, as an elderly person, it's very hard to extend the neck muscles to look at the physician who's standing up and, and talking. So to the extent that you can, uh, try to make it look like you're not in a hurry. Try to sit down. Try to put yourself at the same level of a patient. Try to remember that in all these communications, there's a lot that can happen. Uh, studies have shown that we communicate in a very different way. We all, men and women, communicate in a different way to women than to men. And, and I'll, I'll let you read all those, all those things for yourself. We communicate differently to elderly patients, uh, significantly different. When we perceive somebody to be um, a lot less knowledgeable, we treat those patients in a different way. And I'm sure that if you look in your mind, you'll remember events in which you gave no credit to somebody and you started describing something in childish ways, only to realize that this person He's an engineer that worked all his life in Boeing and is now in 78 years of age, but he invented the 777 or something of that nature. <laughs> and you feel like an idiot, and you should. <laughs> so, so and, and, a, and a particular aspect of the communication, of course, that, that hurts us every single day is when we have to communicate with people that speak a different language. Uh, many think that having interpreted services is the key to that. Well, remember, interpreters can only tell you words that they know how to translate into English, right? But remember that those words originate from somebody whose social trust is different, whose experiences in life have been different, whose culture, whose ethnic background, whose beliefs on others are completely different. So there's a lot more than the words that the interpreters can do that have to do with the culture of the person and where the person comes from. So I have tried to describe primarily for you today aspects that I believe are important in the patient-physician relationship. I believe that when that is enhanced through the understanding, the practical understanding of what trust and communications are, that you improve physician well-being. I am absolutely convinced that for many of us it's a great deterrent to burnout and I have told you almost nothing about the surgeon and the team because a lot of this is related to this. If this works well, if you know yourself and you can talk to your soul, in the only way that you can talk to your soul is when you walk the walk that we're talking about, then this one almost automatically uh, works just as well. So all of that is to try to show you that trust is important. The trust takes a tremendous amount of time to construct, as this picture 
tries to show you, is complicated, is fragile, and it can be destroyed in one minute. So it takes forever to get it really cemented as a bond between two human beings, and it can be completely destroyed in just one second. So beware of both circumstances. You cannot accelerate the process by which somebody will trust you. You can certainly accelerate the process by which somebody will uh, not destroy it. And with that in mind, I submit to you, take every opportunity that you have in your professional life, in your personal life, to, to show other people that you really care. And, and that way, uh, as you transit the life of yours and through the winding parts of life, uh, keep remembering that, as people said in other words, no one, no one will care how much you know until you show them how much you care. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think you can all see why there was value in coming here this morning, including, you know, canceling neurosurgery grand rounds and, and being here. Th thank you, Rich. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, what questions do you have for Carlos? Rich. Yeah, let, uh, we'll use the microphone. Carlos, that was a wonderful talk as usual. But um, have you ever gotten a patient that you say, I will not operate on because I can't establish trust with? In other words, someone who comes to you says, I want 100% um, confidence that you'll take the esophageal tumor out or I'll go somewhere else. Uh, yes, Richard, the, the, the answer is yes, very rarely, because I, I have tried to get around and show around, but I have, I have had both situations, patients who, after talking with me, unfortunately, I remember one in particular, walked away uh, feeling that I had disillusioned him. He was a 60-some-year-old patient who whose values, he said, had nothing to do with mine and I was unwilling to help him. So the patient walked away from me. I have rarely, but I have occasionally found that I could not deal with a patient because I cannot trust them. And I just tell them, look, I have been trying desperately to help you. That is why I chose to go into medicine. I am unable to do that. I'm not putting a judgment on this. I am just not the right person to help you. So I can connect you with somebody else, but I, I can't help. And I think we have to be truthful with that. I have a question about, you talked early on about um, trust and about being educated about how to gain trust. Uh, that uh, there is obviously courses and, and processes and I was thinking about it and how, how much value we could have in that, but also thinking about, in, in a sense, the way that, that there are conflicts and incentives. Trust can also be used um, adversely. It can be manipulative. We, you know, salesmen gain trust and use it to manipulate emotions and to make us want something that maybe we don't need. How, how do we navigate that and get educated about how to gain trust better and use it sincerely? And, and I, I, I understand exactly what you're saying, but I think that that relates back to the concept that we were talking about. Uh, look, I, I look at the physician in a way, and it may sound paternalistic, but I look at the physician as a guardian as a guardian of that trust that you want to generate from the patient. And in order not to manipulate it, I think that the best, the best we can do is to remember what are the incentives that drive us to do X or to not do X. And to then back off and say, I have a commitment to altruism, right? That was one of the three conditions of trust that Barber described, the sociologist that I showed you earlier. How do, I, how do I best protect the interest of this vulnerable person today? What is my role in doing that? 
And I think if you, if you know as much as you can what drives you to do that, I want to sell this car to you, but I have a moral obligation that that salesman doesn't have, and, and you know, the person who's trying to sell you a car, for example, doesn't have a social contract that obligates that person. The, the trust that society has put on us, physicians, is totally different. Patients are not going to be checking you out, usually, as much as they would check the salesman. And so knowing what drives us, knowing that the patient is vulnerable, knowing our obligation to altruism, I say all I can do is try to navigate the best I can with balance between what incentives I have, what obligations to society I have, and what obligations I have to the patient. There isn't a perfect solution. Right. Well, Carlos, you, um, you kept a straight face while this came down during the questions. And that, that was I cannot imagine. That was impressive. Uh, I, I'm uh, glad that you did that. Uh, Barclay, Estelle, and Katie, can you come back up here? You guys disappeared. You were, you were up here well, but um, it, in honor of Dr. Pellegrini's 23 years as a chair of the Department of Surgery, we, we commissioned a painting, um, a, a portrait of Dr. Pellegrini, uh, to be hung up in the hallway of uh, the Department of Surgery. We thought this was uh, a, a great place to unveil it. You've just given us the perfect grand rounds on trust and uh, on all the reasons that you've had the leadership positions that you've had and the reasons that we respect you and admire you. And uh, so three of our chief residents who managed to navigate that down here because I couldn't find a place to hide it uh, up front and managed to navigate it successfully. Good job. I thought you guys would be the great people to, to uh, unveil it. I can't see it from here. Thank you, Carlos. And thank, thank you all for coming to Grand Rounds. Perfect. Really appreciate it. Very nice. I love it. Thank you.